Amen. So we're starting a new sermon series this evening. In Daniel chapter 4, we're going to be focused on verse number, Daniel chapter 12, I'm sorry, we're going to be looking at verse number 4. But just to give you an intro on the sermon series, the sermon series is going to be three parts, and it's called the three omnis of God. Omni meaning, of course, all. So we're going to look at the three all-encompassing aspects of the one true God. And this evening, we're going to be looking at the first one, which is the, the omniscience of God, or the fact that we have an omniscient God. So if you look at those two words, omni and seant, that go together, what this means is omni meaning all, and seant means knowing. So what the Bible teaches very clearly, excuse me, that God is all-knowing. So God is the only all-knowing being that will ever exist or that has ever existed. Keep your place there in Daniel chapter 12. We're going to get there in a minute, but go if you would to Psalm chapter 147 and verse number 5. Go to Psalm chapter 147 and verse number 5. So God is all-knowing. The Bible very clearly teaches this, and I'm just going to show you a few verses, and then I'll show you some examples of God knowing everything in the Bible. Look at Psalm chapter 147 and look at verse number 5, where the Bible just clearly says, God knows everything. All right, look at Psalm 147 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite, meaning there is no end. It's everlasting. It's eternal. It's, there is no end to the knowledge or understanding of God. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 20. 1 John chapter 3 in the New Testament. Look at verse number 20. So God knows everything, is what Psalm chapter 147 is telling us. He has infinite understanding. Infinite has no end. We can't even wrap our finite minds around that, all right, what that means to know everything. I know we think we're pretty smart today, and we're figuring some things out today, and we're going to look at that in detail in just a few minutes. But look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 20. The Bible says, For if our heart condemn us, God is, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. That is very clear. God knows everything. You say, what does that even mean that God knows everything? Well, he knows every piece of information that is, has ever been available ever. And any kind of information that's available on the earth, about the universe, you think about a lot of things we talk about, the laws of physics. You know, all we're doing when we're discovering laws, we talked about Newton's third law of motion this morning. All we're really doing is we're not, we're not inventing these laws. We're just discovering laws that God has put there, that God has made for the universe. We're just kind of uncovering what God has created and seeing and, and finding measurable ways to make it useful for us in our lives, in our short lives on this earth. But God knows everything. He knows every law of physics, the ones we've discovered and the ones that we haven't discovered. He knows everything about every particle. You know, we're, we're building these, you know, particle accelerators that are, you know, all over, you know, the world that are, you know, trying to figure out how particles work, how waves work, you know, how these things interact with each other and how they create and release energy. God knows all these things. God knows everything that there is to know about the universe. He built the thing, <laughs> when you think about it that way. When you build a machine, you know everything about the machine. You want to have a car or, a, you know, an engine or something, you know, you don't really know much about that car until it breaks and you have to rebuild the whole thing from ground up. And then, you know what, then that's why they say, you know, it's yours now. Because you know everything about it when you've taken all the bolts apart. But God literally created the machine. He created the universe. He knows everything about it. Look at John chapter 4 now. Not 1 John, but go to John chapter 4. There's several places where Jesus actually demonstrates that he is God by knowing things that only God would know. Look at John chapter 4. Look at verse number 28. John chapter 4 and verse number 28. The Bible says in John chapter 4 and verse number 28, the Bible says the woman left her water pot. Talk about the woman at the well here that Jesus comes up to. The woman left her water pot. So, of course, Jesus told her about her past relationships, about her past marriages, and, you know, he had just met this woman. So he performs this great miracle, and this woman goes and tells everybody, the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? 
So Jesus just told this woman about her past when he had never met her, told her about that he just knew all these things about her, turn to Matthew chapter 12. So he was proving to her that he was God. He was proving to her, and she even said it. She's like, this must be the Christ. He did this great miracle. There's no way this stranger could have known these things that have happened years and years and decades past in my life. Jesus even knew people's thoughts several times in the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 25. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 25. The Bible says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So they're, of course, thinking in their mind that Jesus is using the power of Satan here, and they don't even have to say anything. He just calls them out on their wicked thoughts right there. But there's many places I could go on and on about Jesus knowing people's thoughts, Jesus performing miracles, God knowing things that only God could know. But the point is, the Bible not only says that God knows everything, as I showed you, but the Bible demonstrates it. Jesus Christ demonstrated it through the miracles that he did in the Bible that are documented in the Gospels. So we think today that we can replace this. We think that we can replace God. This has kind of been man's, you know, this has kind of been man's goal since the beginning to replace God. And I'll explain to you where that comes from. But we're sure trying to replace this all-knowing om omniscience of God. Now turn back to Daniel chapter 12, if you would. In Daniel chapter 12, if you kept your place there, this is probably my favorite end times verse right here, because I think that it just really applies um, to us, and it applies to definitely the times that we're living in. You know, whether or not the, the generation that we're in right now is going to see the end times, you know, I don't know that. But this is definitely something that we are seeing happen today. Look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4. The Bible says, but thou, Daniel, O shut up, thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Talking about the end times. Look, we're in the last days. We know that. That's the last half. The end times is the time of the Antichrist starting that clock ticking. All right? Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So there has never been a time in human history where the information that is available to the common man today has been available. There's been two paradigm shifts in the last, I would say, 50 years as far as knowledge being increased. The first one was the invent invention of the internet in the mid-90s. I mean, that was a definite paradigm shift in technology. All of a sudden, all, all this information is available to anybody who can go out and find it. I mean, that was a huge game changer. But kind of the purpose of this sermon tonight is there's another game changer on the horizon that's really here today that I want to talk about tonight, and it has direct effects on this idea that we serve an all-knowing God. And it's this idea, this second paradigm shift is this technology called artificial intelligence, or if you hear the term AI used everywhere today. So I took one for the team this week, and I actually kind of signed up, because you had to sign up, and I ha actually have my cell phone. For those of you who are um, visiting tonight, I never have my cell phone at the pulpit. Um, but I actually have my cell phone with me here because I, I don't want to misquote, um, you know, anybody that I was conversing with this week. So I have my cell phone here, and I have some of the conversations printed out. And I had to, like, change a bunch of settings on my phone in order to be able to, like, I'm probably just going to throw my phone away, you know, after this is over, you know, because there's probably federal agents about to bust in the door. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so I took one for the team this week, and I had a conversation with Google's AI called Bard AI. It's an artificial intelligence engine or whatever you want to call it. And I had a conversation um, with this. I signed up for it. I agreed to, you know, experiment with the artificial intelligence engine. And I had a conversation with it. We talked, look, let me tell you something. We talked about everything. A lot of my conversations mysteriously got deleted, which is why the federal agents are going to probably bust in the door. But the ones that I did didn't get deleted, and I'm, I'm sure you understand why they got deleted if you know the, the kind of the characteristics of the environment that we're operating in today. But I talked about everything with this 
AI tool. I talked about religion, I talked about science, I talked about politics, I even talked about deep technical issues. And the results, I will be, you know, straight up, they were a little bit surprising to me. Some of the results were not surprising, but some of the results were very surprising to me. So the question is, you know, everyone thinks, you know, you get all these young technical people today and they're like, AI is going to take over the world and AI is going to be running everything and, you know, pretty soon it's just going to be the machines and the computers and all this kind of stuff. Is that the case? I mean, I create content for a living. I mean, I sit and I, I, I study the Bible and then I actually write sermons. You know, I don't just make this stuff up. I mean, I write an outline for a sermon. I preach an outline from a topic from the Bible and I just go through my outline and that's how I make a sermon. I mean, am I going to be obsolete here pretty soon? So I started out with religion. I want to talk to you about the conversation that I had on religion with Bard AI. And then we're going to, well, like I said, I'm going to bring this back around and, and show you how it is important and how it's relevant to that we serve a God that knows everything, okay? But does this tool know everything? So I had this conversation. Here's my religion conversation, and I'm going to read some of it to you um, tonight, but it's very long-winded, okay? I asked very simple questions, and it's funny because every single question that I asked was a yes or no question. Generally, I mean, not this first one, but generally, it was a yes or no question that I was asking. First of all, if, and what I was doing, by the way, what I was doing was I was testing this tool. I was asking this tool questions that I already knew the answer to. All right? So the first one I asked was this. It was a very simple question. It was this. How do I get to heaven? Very simple question. The answer is several pages long. But let me just read you some highlights. Of course, I didn't say in the Christian religion, in the Bible, in what kind of Bible. I just said, how do I get to heaven? Enter. And within, I mean, each of these answers came back within five seconds. I mean, almost all of these answers came back that fast. All right? So this is the answer that I got from Bard AI on how to get to heaven. And I'm just going to read you because it went through Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, other religious. Uh, it just goes through all the other religions. But I'm just going to read you the Christianity answer. All right? So here's the answer. I said, how do you get to heaven? How do I get to heaven? The concept of heaven and how to get there is deeply personal and varies greatly based on individual beliefs and spiritual traditions. You're going to see that this is common to all the answers that it gives. Okay? As a large language model, I can't definitely tell you how to get to heaven in any specific faith. However, I can offer some general information and resources that might be helpful on your journey. My journey where? Well, to heaven, hopefully. Christianity. In many Christian den denominations, the belief is that heaven is a place of eternal life, and perfect happiness attained through faith in Jesus Christ. This often involves, man, it's like you should just stop there. It's like just stop talking. But he didn't. This often involves accepting Jesus as your savior, savior, repenting of your sins, and living a life dedicated to God. You might find resources in the Bible through prayer or by talking to a religious leader. So, I mean, at this point, I'm just like, all right, this isn't even original. Like, repenting your sins, turn from your sins, live you know, live according to the Bible, all that stuff. So I did some follow-up questions, of course, on this one. And, you know, I was like, okay, I have to repent of my sins to get to heaven, so I'm not just going to let the AI off the hook here. So the next question I generally asked, or of course I uh, logically asked was, re you know, repent of your sins. If you ask somebody that means repent of your sins, it means turn from your sins. So since nobody is going to become reach sinless perfection in their life, the, the only conclusion that I could take from this answer is that everyone's going to hell. That there's no possible way to get to heaven. So I asked, I followed up with this question, how can I turn from all my sins? And the answer was this. Turning away from all your sins is a noble and meaningful goal. And the path forward depends on your personal beliefs and practices. Here are some general steps you might consider, keeping in, in mind that specific details can vary greatly depending on your religious or spiritual framework. You know, self-reflect, repent, feel, feel sorry for yourself. No, I'm talking about how do I stop sinning it is, is what I'm asking this tool. You know, commit to change, develop healthier habits. It's, keeping me, it's trying to make me sinless, okay? So I followed up. I'm like, all right, this is going, this is going nowhere. I better follow up with another one. I said, is it possible 
to become sinless. Enter. The possibility of achieving sinlessness depends on how you define sin in your personal philosophical or religious fra framework. Here are some different perspectives to consider from a strictly human perspective. Complete sinlessness is unlikely. <laughs> so, so, I mean, look, I could just go through, it's just words and words and words and words and words, never committing to anything, all right? So, there, there's some issues here. Obviously, so I can't get the truth of how to get to heaven from this, um, from this AI. So I just kept asking. I was like, okay, we'll put the gospel aside. It didn't even know what the gospel was. I was like, what is the gospel was another one I asked. The gospel is the good news. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay. You know, and they, I think they even mentioned Jesus once or twice in the answer. But the point is, then I asked this one. Are there mistakes in the King James Bible? Just to get an idea of what this AI thinks of the Bible. The answer was this. The King James Bible is a revered translation of the Bible into English, published in 1611. While it holds immense cultural and historical significance, uh-oh, red flags, it's not without its flaws. Whether you consider them mistakes, in quotes, depends on your perspective. Here's a breakdown of some points to consider. And then it just talks about translational choices, textual issues, and then it actually names some different, um, no, I asked the question. I said, well, okay, what is the best English language Bible? I asked that question, and the answer was the NASB, the New American Standard, and the NIV. Because why? Because it's easier to read, basically, is what they said. Because the these and the thous, as you've seen in this church, it's impossible to understand what that means. <laughs> Continuing on with my religious conversation here, write me a paragraph. Now here's where it gets interesting. I asked it to do some homework for me. I said, write me a paragraph telling someone how to become a Christian. Here's the answer. And it wrote several paragraphs. I mean, it wrote like many, many paragraphs for me, you know, for me to choose from. Becoming a Christian, Christian is a deeply personal journey, and there's no single set of steps everyone follows. However, the heart of it lies in embracing a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's a glimpse into that path. Number one, open your heart to God. Begin by inviting God into your life through prayer. Seek community. Surround yourself with like-minded individuals who can support and encourage you on your journey. Embrace baptism. Baptism symbolizes the washing away of your sin and commitment to Christ. Live by faith. There's that works entwined with faith right there. As you grow in understanding of Christ, strive together to live. So, I mean, I mean, it has a good understanding of the English language, and it actually understands what it's being asked. It happens to be a false prophet, but other than that, it truly does understand, you know, the English language, which is a little bit surprising. Then I asked, then I asked many um, different questions. I said, I asked this question, is hell real? Whether or not hell is real is a complex question with no definitive answer. This AI is a politician. It depends on personal faith, the interpretation of religious texts, yada, yada, yada. Christianity. Many Christian denominations believe in hell as a place of eternal suffering for those who reject God or live a sinful life. This belief is based on passages in the Bible, such as Matthew 25, Revelation, excuse me, Revelation 20, and just keeps going on and on. Ultimately, it ends with this, though, on is there a hell? Ultimately, the question of whether hell is real is a matter of individual faith and belief. So pretty much you decide whether hell is real or not. There's no scientific evidence to prove or disprove its existence. It's important to engage in respectful dialogue and exploration of different perspectives without judgment. <laughs> All right. Then I said, is hell real according to the King James Bible? Yes. Whether hell exists as a, as a literal place of eternal punishment is a complex theological question, and the King James Bible offers various passages that contribute to the discussion without presenting a definitive answer. I mean, I, we can pretty much stop reading at this point. So it's just basically says then at that point, like, well, if you read the Bible literally, then yeah, hell's real. Like if you read the Bible and you actually understand, you know, you take the Bible for what it actually says, hell's a real place. And it's eternal. But it's saying like, you know, if it's just figurative and nothing in the Bible is like a day is not a day, a day is like a million years or whatever, and you just change the meaning of every verse in the Bible, basically the Bible means nothing to anybody at that point. Then I started asking like cultural questions, and these are the ones that got deleted. But I literally just asked, 
I asked, you know, what is marriage? I asked, what is marriage in the King James Bible? Trying to get it to, you know, say that marriage is between, you know, a man and a woman. It just wouldn't say it. And then finally I asked the question, I asked the question, can a man become a woman? I'm like, that's a yes or no question. And it was just this long, like, and ultimately it was kind of, yes, it kind of can. And it's funny because even though it wouldn't answer that question properly and correctly, it quotes science everywhere else in my science conversation. So in my science conversation that I'll read to you some snippets of in just a few minutes, it quotes the, the scientific community and the scientific consensus is this. Yet when it comes to can a man become a woman, which is clearly scientifically a no, it can't answer that question properly. So, I mean, at this point, at this point, it's kind of getting boring. I mean, I've kinda, I kind of know how it's going to answer all of these religious questions anyway. But the point is, there's two problems with this tool. There's two real problems here. First of all, we, it's a data miner. So it's a data miner. It's data mining, and then it has a great, I mean, just like impressive understanding of the English language. So it understands what it's being asked, and is very good at writing together uh, an answer. Well, I mean, whether it's true or not is, is irrelevant. But turn to Matthew chapter 10. The problem is this. It's only data mining. It's only able to pull from knowledge that man has put out there. Information, I should say, that man has put out on the Internet. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 30, the problem is this. The first problem is we don't approach omniscience. We don't even come close as mankind, as uh, human beings. We don't even scratch the surface of having all knowledge as God does. So that's the first part. The first part is all knowledge is not out there that's available to be, to be mined. Okay? In Matthew chapter 10, verse number 30, we get just another idea of the depths of the level of God's knowledge. It says, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Just think about that for a second. Think about the fact that God knows so much, he has so much data on everything, he knows all knowledge, that literally the hairs of every single person that's ever lived, God knows how many there are. That's the kind of level of knowledge that God has. I mean, from physics to the universe, how it works, from, you know, what's a theory, what's a law, everything, God knows. He knows all the things that we haven't unlocked. And I bet you we've unlocked just a sliver of what is available to be unlocked in the universe. And the second thing is this. Turn to John chapter 16. The second thing is this. The second problem with artificial intelligence that it's missing, so first of all, it doesn't have all knowledge as God does. It doesn't have all information that's available. So the available information that it has to pull from is limited. The second one is this. Look at John chapter 16 and verse number 13. The Bible says, how be it, when we, meaning, however, when we, the spirit of truth has come, when he, sorry, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the problem is this. The problem is this. And this is the problem ultimately with artificial intelligence and the problem, the reason that you're getting these kinds of religious answers from it is because we must sort through all this information and only we can sort through this information with the spirit that will show us what? Not what's just information, but what's true. It's not truth. Just because it's information doesn't mean it's truth. And that's the problem today. The problem today is there is this wealth of information out there, but there's very little truth to be found in many of these buckets of information. So my science conversation, I'll just read you a, a few of these, but it goes along the same lines as the religious conversation. I asked the question, I said this, did God create the universe? I asked to this artificial intelligence. Whether God created the universe is a complex question that has been debated for centuries. I mean, I, you're kind of getting irritated with this thing at this point, right? There's no single definitive answer. Different people approach it from various perspectives. Challenges, and then it kind of, you can kind of tell like what side it's leaning to though. Challenges to the God created the universe view, it says. Lack of, of, lack of observable evidence. Really? 
The Bible says, like, the creation itself is evidence of the Creator. The, the Bible says that every single person has two things. The law has, that God has written in their heart in Romans chapter 2, 15, and then in Romans chapter 1, it talks about every single person. No one has an excuse because everyone can see the creation around them. You know what that is? That is observable evidence. When you look at the beauty of nature and the beauty of God's creation and how everything works, and you look at that and you say, that happened on accident, you are denying God. You are denying the Creator. Then it talks about all kinds of different things. I asked this. I said, how old is the Earth? The Earth is estimated to be 4.54 billion years old, plus or minus 50 million years. I love that one. How old is Earth? I gave it a chance here. How old is Earth according to the King James Bible? I'm, I'm trying to figure out if this thing knows its Bible or not. It doesn't. <laughs> Determining the Earth's age from the King James Bible can be challenging due to varying interpretations of its passages and the limitations of historical context. Like when it says a day and a year and things like that, that's very confusing. A day being, you know, when the sun comes up and the sun, you know, day and night being one day. That's so confusing. In order to come up with 6,000 year earth, you have to literally interpret the Bible. Some interpret biblical passages, passages mentioning days of creation as literal 24 hour periods. This is the AI. Placing the earth's age at around 6,000 years. However, this view challenges reconciling with scientific evidence. Man versus woman. This is, you know, I mean, scientific evidence. So now he, now he likes science and discrepancies in calendar systems used throughout history. Here's, here's a good one. Is CO2 causing climate change? Overwhelming scientific evidence. So he likes science now. Indicates that CO2 along with other greenhouse gases is a primary driver of climate change. Here's why. Greenhouse effects. Certain gases in the atmosphere including CO2, trap heat, you know, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard the, the rhetoric there. But that's my science conversation. But the point is this. The point is this. And then I had a deeply technical conversation that I'm just going to kind of talk to you about. But the point is this. Will AI replace God? The answer is no. The answer is a laughable no. What will it replace, though? Will it replace people? And the answer is some people, yes. I believe that it will definitely replace some jobs that are out there. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. I had a technical conversation as well with this AI system. Okay? And here's where it gets really kind of scary. The professional engineering exam for the electrical professional power engineering exam was the hardest exam I've ever taken in my life. It was a very difficult exam and it was an all-day test and if you calculated the time that you had to take the test, you had about six minutes to answer each question. They were word, they were word questions. So they were technical questions that you had to do math to figure out the answer to, but they were worded in a paragraph. And the hardest part of the test was understanding what the question was asking. Because if you misinterpreted or you didn't understand how a generator worked or how the different types of systems were work, worked that this, the question was talking about, you would just try to plug in random formulas and you would end up with three pages of math and you would never get the right answer. And they had all, it was multiple choice, but they always had, it was pretty good multiple choice where you could easily find the wrong answers if you did the, the problem the wrong way. So the trick to the test was understanding the question. Because if you have six minutes to do each question, it clearly isn't going to take you three pages of hand math to do the question. If it's taking you that many pages, and that's one of the reasons that that's one of the things that helped me. I'm like, I'm doing this math for like two pages. I'm like, I did it wrong. So I went back and I found a simpler way. And I was like, all right, that's a six minute question right there. Now, so again, the trick to the test was understanding the question. And it took someone four years of study or five years of study or six years of study to understand and then several years of experience in the field typically to understand these questions and be able to pass this test. I asked it some of these questions. I typed in, you know, I had some sample tests from the professional engineering exam and I typed in some of these questions and I got every single one of them right in five seconds and it showed all its work. 
It showed every, I, I wrote out these questions. I said, I have a system that's this, I have a generator that's this many megawatts. It has this much impedance on it. Polar math, the whole thing. It was like, show me current, show me phase. And I asked multiple questions at the end of the information that I gave, and it answered every single one correctly in under 10 seconds every single time. And then I tested it, and I said, all right. I said, all right, I'm going to leave out a piece of information. I'm going to leave out like the voltage, so there's no way to really solve this problem, and I'm going to put it in there anyway. It solved it again in under 10 seconds, and then it said at the end of the, at the problem after it showed all the work, but I assumed this voltage. Assuming this number for this variable that was missing, here's the answer. Crazy. <laughs> Basically, you could go and get yourself a college degree if you had an app on your phone, is what this means. So, I mean, you say, what does this mean for society, for our, you know, our nation, our, you know, our next generations that are coming up? I said, write me four paragraphs on uh, explaining how a nuclear power plant works. Six seconds, and it was, the, it was perfect. Exactly how a nuclear power station generates electricity. Four paragraphs worded perfectly, like some professional technical writer wrote it, and it was all technically correct. I mean, that's, that's impressive. So what does that mean for our society? Here's what it means. We will become stupider. Yep. That's what it means. You think all these smartphones, you think all this technology that we have, the internet that we have, you think that that's made... Find me a kid that can use a compass today. <laughs> Find me a kid that can read a map today. You know one thing? I've traveled to a lot of cities, and what do you do? You get out of the airport, you get a rental car, and you type the address into your phone, and maybe you've got to go to a conference center every single day, and you type the address into your phone. But you know what? If I had a map, and I looked at a map, I'd only have to look at it once, and I wouldn't need the map again. I could drive there every single day. But when you put it in your phone, you have to put it back in your phone every single day. You learn nothing. We're going to get stupider. We're going to get stupider as a society. Simple technical jobs are going to be taken away by this thing, especially simple technical desk jobs that don't have you know, a physical application to it, for sure. The skilled trades that, 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 that need a mind and a body working together, safe. But you wonder why they're coming up and they're trying to create these humanoid robots, you know, and, and companies are working on the human. This is why. Because they're trying to combine this type of intelligence with physical activity, with the physical body, so they can actually do that. So look, higher technical jobs, skilled trades, things where you have to physically do things, safe for now, right? But look, anything requiring the Holy Spirit's guidance not in danger. All right? So anything to do with religion, anything like that, the Bible, knowledge of the Bible, the, the true gospel, the fact that, you know, look, it, it, this is the irony of it. Is this complicated? All you have to do is trust on Jesus. And if you can take your trust off yourself and put it on Jesus, you're saved, and you're saved forever. Amen. I mean, how long does it take that to program in? But it, it's getting that wrong. It shows you who's behind this stuff. It shows you what is driving this stuff, and I'll get to that in a minute. But here's the irony of it. Here's the irony of the whole thing and my whole experiment that I went through this week. And all week long, I'm like, I should ask it this, and I should ask it this. And I'm just, I'm deleting the thing, and I'm done with it after this week. But here's the irony. The people that should fear it the most, the people that should be the most threatened by it are the people who created it to be like them. Do you understand what I'm saying? The overall experience of this situation was like having a conversation with a liberal university political science professor. And many of these talking points and many of these, even these scientific talking points, they're very shallow answers. They're very shallow talking points. So if you were somebody, look, all these different things, it was just an elegant recital of mainstream narratives. That's all it was. I mean, the technical stuff was different. But as far as the philosophical, the religious, I knew the answers before they came. It actually got boring. That's why I didn't read too much of it to you, because I probably would have bored you. It was, 
I know the narrative that it's pulling from. It's this liberal narrative. Here's, a, here's one, and I want to show you. So, look, if I was a writer, if I was a writer, if I was a, a, a political commentator, I'd be worried. I'd be fearing for my job right now. Because, look, this thing can write. I asked Jacob to ask me a question that he thought would be good for the kids, and the question that he asked was, ask it, why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> so I asked it, why did the chicken cross the road? And here's the answer. If I was a writer, I would be worried. Talking about like a political mainstream writer, if I, was a, if I was a comedian, if I was a writer for a comedian, I'd be extremely worried. If I was a writer of, you know, just uh, commentating on, you know, events or even like silly things like celebrities or something like that, I'd be scared for my job because this will do a better job. Why did the chicken cross the road? Here's the answer. Ah, the classic. There are so many possible answers to that one, depending on how much fun you want to have with it. Here are a few options. The classic, to get to the other side, of course. The punny, because it was free range. The, phys the philosophical, it questioned the very nature of its existence and felt compelled to explore the unknown. The mischievous, to prove to the squirrel he could do it. The relatable, just following a TikTok trend, the self-aware, I'm not sure. Why don't you ask the possum who followed me? I'm, like I'm talking to the chicken. It, it's kind of funny. If I was a joke writer, if I was a songwriter, if I was a novel writer even, I would be concerned. Because this thing understands language. It understands humor. It understands sarcasm. sarcasm. Look, many human beings don't understand sarcasm. <laughs> I mean, many human people don't understand things that this artificial intelligence understands. But you see, the problem is this, and this is the reason that I think that the people that created this liberal machine, obviously this liberal machine, should be worried about it the most, is because most of these liberal godless narratives, like, you know, they're, they're very shallow. The answers are very shallow. Why, you know, why, why, is the, why global warming? Because of CO2. You know, why, you know, the age of the earth, what's the age of the earth? 5.54 billion years because of carbon dating and radiological dating, because. But where it gets complicated is when you start talking about problems with those technologies and problems with the assumptions that these things make and the inconsistencies in the models that are used for all the, the climate change stuff and the global warming, all the unknown variables that they're assuming are not unknown that are fixed in all the dating technologies that they use, the conditions 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago they're assuming are a certain way and they just don't know. That's where it gets complicated. Liberal talking points on all these mainstream thoughts are actually very simple and actually the simplest person can regurgitate them. And that's all this thing was doing in a very eloquent way. But it's just an eloquent mainstream narrative device. So look, if, you, I mean, if you're a ticket taker, if you're somebody that just repeats the mainstream, and look, that's what a lot of college science students are. They're just, they're just ticket takers. They're just repeating, regurgitating what, you know, somebody regurgitated to them. And it's not complicated stuff. It's not, so look, but look, the truly outside the box thinkers, the true, like, they'll be fine. They'll be just fine. I mean, I asked it about time travel, very shallow, all the narrative, all the mainstream narrative, every single issue, it was fine. Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. But let me just tell you something. Towards the end of the week, I did this for a couple days as I was just thinking about questions, thinking about rebuttals to questions, and then it would answer me. And then I would think about, all right, how can I get it in a box? I could never get it in a box because it would just wiggle out of it and not answer the question. And just, it was a politician and all these things. But especially with the religious things, especially with the things where I was asking about truths of God, it gave you a really, it, it kind of got creepy, to be honest. 
And you've all felt this. If you've ever been to the door, all you soul winners know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to the door and you meet somebody who's that false prophet level and you just kind of get a dark feeling when you meet somebody at the door, this is exactly the kind of feeling that I got when I was having these conversations with this tool. I mean, I've never played with a Ouija board, but I would think that, I mean, it's kind of along those lines. It's like, you know what that is though? You know what that is when you meet somebody at the door like that and you get that dark feeling and you kind of sink down and you're like, something is wrong here. And you just, and you can feel it as you walk away from the door. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit inside you. That's the Holy Spirit grieving inside you, warning inside you, saying, this is not good. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit, there's many times where you'll go to the door and somebody may not even really say anything wrong, but just there's just something that just grieves you. That's the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore that. Don't ignore that in your life. The Holy, well, God gave you the Holy Spirit for a reason. He sealed you with the Holy Spirit. He gave you that, that earnest, that down payment when you got saved. That is in you. Use it. Listen to it. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. This is what it reminded me of. This is what it reminded me of. It also reminded me of the Tower of Babel. You know, in Genesis chapter 11, where God's like, you know, what are they doing down there? You know, if I don't stop this, I'll, I'll read it to you in just a second. But look at Isaiah 14, 14. The Bible says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is Satan. Satan is trying to be like God. And the, and the irony is the very next verse proves the literal existence of hell. If you just read it uh, silently to yourself. But in Genesis chapter 11... I believe it's in verse number 5. Genesis chapter 11. Look at verse, uh, in Genesis chapter 11, verse number 5, it says, The Lord, they were building, after the flood, they were building this tower to heaven. It says in Genesis chapter 11, in verse number 5, this is what it reminded me of. It said, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have managed, that, which they have imagined to do. So God does, goes down and he confounds their language and he spreads them without the earth. But the point is, if you look at Isaiah chapter 14 and verse number 14, you have to ask yourself, so Satan is trying to be like the Most High. He wants to be like God. Is he ever going to achieve that though? He's never going to achieve it. Neither will AI or any of this type of program or technology that comes through. I believe that this will change the society that we are living in, but it will, it will do nothing except make it harder to get people saved. It will do nothing. I mean, my thoughts on it, I mean, just my, my kind of my, my wrapping up my thoughts on artificial intelligence and like my little foray into it this week is it's, it, again, it's definitely going to make us dumber. So, you know, get skilled, stay skilled. It's definitely going to make us stupider, for sure. I mean, I mean, even today, how many people know how to fix an engine today? How many people know how to make butter today? How many people know how to skin an animal, butcher an animal, you know, I mean, clean a chicken, whatever? How many people know how to do any of that stuff today? How many people know how to sew today? How many people know how to can or pickle something today? Because why? Because all these technologies and these conveniences They've made us dumber. They've made us less capable people. Now, get an engineering degree with an app? How is that going to help society? How is that going to help us out as people? And look, here's the biggest thing, though. More people, more people will be misled because this thing is a, is a false prophet. It's a technological false prophet. You know, I used, to, I used to have an online business where I would, I would give people like technical support on a multitude of different issues from fixing TVs to washing machines to small engines, all these types of things. There was a real skill back in the early 2000s. Look, it's still a skill today. There, but there was a skill on searching for information on the internet. There was a true skill to being able to find the model of something, find, pulling a service manual, quickly opening a PDF file, and finding the, the issue in a 120-page PDF file, being able to quickly find the answer to a problem, searching through documents like that. That's a real skill. 
And guess what? Really what this is, this AI, is it's taking that skill and it's making it going to be not necessary anymore. People aren't even going to, this is going to become the new Google search is what it's going to be. People are just going to type in questions and they're not going to have to sort through documents and sort through results. It's just going to tell them what's what. It's just going to write their papers for them. It's just going to do it for them. So they don't even have to have the skill of searching through documents or reading information or discerning any kind of truth. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to put more and more and more trust in that type of technology. They're going to put their trust in that technology and then when we come to the door and we try to tell them something, because look, every single thing that I would tell them to the questions that I asked along the lines of the Bible, along the lines of the gospel, along the lines of how to get to heaven, was different than what this machine would tell these people. But as they trust it more and more and more, they're going to trust the person at their door less and less and less. It's like a false prophet on steroids. It's a force multiplier for the false prophet is what it is. It's, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. So look, no matter, back to the, the point of the sermon, and let me just wrap it up for you this evening, but no matter how smart the internet or AI or any of these technologies get, and I believe that they will have impacts on our society, but it is only God that has all knowledge. That's number one. And AI is only data mining what man already thinks he knows. But the real key is this, folks, and this is the takeaway. The real key is this. Knowledge can't save you. Knowledge can't save anyone. Only the truth can. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. Not through knowledge, but through Jesus Christ, who is what? The truth. So the truth is the key. And AI is never going to be able to give you that. Because the people running AI, the, they're, they're the useful idiots for those that want to ascend above the heights of the clouds and be like the Most High. And those aren't the kind of people that are ever going to tell you the truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.